What's up, future respiratory therapist? Today, in this video, I'm stepping outside of my comfort zone. We're going to be talking about the difference between epiglottitis versus croup. You don't want to miss this. Let's dive in. All right, so as I stated in this video, I'm stepping outside of my comfort zone to bring you information that you have requested multiple times. Joe, we need some Neo stuff. We need some PD stuff. Look, I'm not that guy. I'm not the Neo PD expert. My background is extensively in adult care, but I feel confident to be able to give you a quick rundown in key things you need to be prepared for when taking your exams and working through your educational process to differentiate between epiglottitis versus croup. Now, I know I told you that I am not a PD expert, but good for you. I actually have a PD expert now working on the team, and there is a course in place right now that is specifically focused on bringing you Neo PD supportive content. That is in the works. When that is done, you will be able to find that right here in the Respiratory Coach Academy. As it stands right now, you can find the TMC Bootcamp, the CSC Bootcamp, and my mini courses, the formulas, pharmacology, and basic arterial blood gas interpretation. You can also find the, the link to my free resources where I have things like mechanical ventilation waveforms, um, an ICU checklist, uh, several resources in there that are there, absolutely no cost to you, no obligation. You can find access to this page right here by looking in the video description below and go visit that and see if there's anything there that you found valuable as well as the upcoming neo pd course that i'm so excited about so hang tight and that's coming soon now back on topic here epiglottitis versus croup the first thing you're going to have to be able to do is differentiate which is which and it's funny because i'm referencing chapter 35 Good old Egan's 13th edition, page 711. And um, it starts off this when talking about croup. It says the evaluation and treatment of a child with croup must focus on distinguishing it from other disorders such as epiglottitis. So we realize that they're not the same, but they can easily be um, confused if we're not on our toes. And so let's talk about some of the key differentiating uh, factors between epiglottitis and croup. We're going to start with epiglottitis. Epiglottitis can be bacterial, viral, or fungal-based uh, infection. So it's not always bacterial, as I have listed right here, but it is commonly bacterial. Um, when we look at epiglottitis, these patients usually present with a high-grade fever and typically a sudden onset of that fever. Now, I put here the four Ds, and you're going to want to remember this. You're going to want to remember these four Ds, okay? The four Ds are this. Dysphonia, which is um, altered speech. Dysphagia, which is difficulty swallowing. Difficulty swallowing can lead to drooling. That's the third D. So dysphonia, difficulty speaking. Dysphagia, difficulty swallowing, leading to drooling. And then three, the upper airway obstruction can lead to distress. And what do I mean by that? That means we're talking about retractions. We're talking about nasal flaring. We're talking about tachypnea, tachycardia. We're talking about respiratory distress. So those are the four Ds, dysphonia, dysphagia, drooling, and distress. If you see those or any combination of those, especially the drooling in either a TMC or a CSC or an exam question during your program, that's a good indication that you're dealing with epiglottitis. And this is important because we're going to see here in a minute that the treatment for these are different. So it's important to pick up on those. And then the last thing here is that the patient presenting with epiglottitis will appear very, very ill. They will look sickly. They won't, they won't look good. So, so we can put all these together and say, okay, Okay, I'm thinking now epiglottitis. Now, the opposite of this is when we think about croup. Now, croup is typically viral-based. It's caused by a virus. Uh, they will present with a barking cough. They will present particularly with strider. And they will be irritable. They're not going to feel good, 
but they're not going to look overwhelmingly sickly or ill like what we're talking about over here with epiglottitis. And so we can see this. And Egan actually talks about this. I don't have it highlighted, so I can't find it here quickly. But Egan actually even talks about the treatment of croup. Unless there is strider at rest, typically is treated at home. And so we can see that, that of these two, epiglottitis is much more life-threatening than croup. And so that's why we have to be on our toes to be able to identify it and, 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 and treat it effectively and early. Now, <clears throat> when we talk about diagnosing, uh, there's different elements that we can use to diagnosis, but the big one for us as respiratory therapists that you're probably going to likely see on your exams is what is the difference in their x-rays? Now, real quick here, when we're talking about the difference in x-rays, this says lateral. That word right there is very, very important. Lateral neck x-ray. Now, when we talk about croup, pretend I didn't put chest right here because it's not really a chest x-ray. It's really an AP neck x-ray. What does that mean? AP means front to back. So we're going to do the x-ray straight on. Lateral means we're going to do it from the side. And so what we know here is that on croup, when we look at an AP neck x-ray, what we're going to see is a steeple sign when we look at the trachea because it's an inflammatory process that narrows the trachea. And so you think about it like um, a building that has a steeple. That narrowing of the trachea right there is what we call the steeple sign. So if you ever hear steeple sign described or mentioned in an exam question, you know you're talking about croup. You see, that's very, very different than what we're going to see over here with epiglottitis. When we take a lateral neck x-ray, we're going to see the thumb sign. And so you're going to see the swollen epiglottis, and it's going to look like the thumb sign. Now, Egan talks about this on page 712, table 35.6. It's very clear in comparing the two of these. I suggest you go look at this so you can see the age differences and different ways that they differentiate them. The neck radiograph findings, croup, steeple sign, caused by narrowing subglottic caused by subglottic narrowing, epiglottitis, lateral neck, neck radiograph, thumb sign, caused by the swollen epiglottis. Now you see you have this content now. You have this knowledge now. Thumb sign, epiglottitis, steeple sign, crew. I think I made that clear. Now once we have identified that we are dealing with an epiglottitis patient, there's a couple things we need to do. First things first, we need to do an elective intubation. And what I mean by elective intubation, I mean it doesn't matter how the patient looks right now. It doesn't matter what their blood gas shows. It doesn't matter. What matters is the fact that we have a patient with an inflamed epiglottis that if not treated effectively and appropriately could swell to a point of complete airway obstruction. And now we have an emergency situation on our hands and we're not going to play around with that. So we're going to electively intubate this patient early to establish an artificial airway so that we don't risk losing an anatomical airway. So um, Egan's again, page 711, visual examination of the upper airway is dangerous in these children. Think about it. Anytime you go to visualize the, the upper airway or the epiglottis, or intubate a patient, you are putting a blade down onto or around the epiglottis. And to do that, you are risking further inflammation that can cause rapid swelling and complete closure. We don't want to do that. It goes on to say that should always be performed in a controlled setting by personnel trained in emergency intubation. What that means is, is get them to the operating room to secure an airway. That's what that means. Okay. Once we get an airway established, we obviously are going to have to provide sedation, comfort, and mechanical ventilation. That all makes sense. But then we're also going to have to find the causative agent of this acute infection. So we need to do bacterial cultures to identify the appropriate antibiotic 
to, to, to treat this infection with so that we can, 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 can reduce the process, shorten the length of duration, and hopefully get that patient extubated quickly. Egan's also says that you should always, 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 prior to extubation, assess a cuff leak. And if you have an improved cuff leak, then it could indicate that the epiglottis is reducing in swelling, but it is not an indication of success from liberation from mechanical ventilation. So a few things there to, to focus on. Um, now, when we talk about croup, we see the steeple sign. We see, okay, how do we reduce this um, sub subglottic edema? And the answer is, is historically cool mist therapy. Think about it, if you have a swollen ankle, if you sprain your ankle and it swells, you put ice on it. That's, that's, a, that's an exudative process. That's the same thing that's happening here. We have an exudative process happening in the subglottic region, and we need to reduce that swelling, cause vasoconstriction. We can't put ice on this, but we can put cool mist aerosol therapy, and that's one of the treatment plans. We can also use pharmacological agents such as racemic epinephrine which is an alpha agonist, which causes vasoconstriction. It will reduce the subglottic edema in these patients. And then also corticosteroids, which will also reduce the inflammatory process. And that is all we are trying to do here is to reduce the inflammatory process to aid the patient to be able to breathe easier throughout this process. Now, you may be saying, well, why can't we give corticosteroids over here in the epiglottitis? Well, <clears throat> I don't know the answer to that, but Egan says the use of glucocorticoids, corticosteroids, in the initial treatment of patients with epiglottitis is no longer recommended. So there's that for you. So that's the key findings with epiglottitis versus croup. Remember the four Ds, drooling, dysphagia, dysphonia, distress, you're thinking epiglottitis, you're looking for the thumbprint sign, and you're going to be electively intubating this patient to secure an airway before we lose an airway. With croup, you're thinking barking cough, strider, steeple sign, reduce inflammation with cool mist, racemic epi, and corticosteroids. And that is the difference between epiglottitis and croup in a very surface level presentation. I'm Respiratory Coach. Stay here with me right here on YouTube. If you haven't already, hit the subscribe button. I know 50% of you haven't, so please hit the subscribe button so you can get these videos to you every single week as I continue to stay loyal to you and to the respiratory therapy community in posting one every single week. Come follow me on Instagram at Respiratory Coach, TikTok at Respiratory Coach, LinkedIn at Joe Lewis, and send me an email, respiratorycoach at gmail.com. I would love to converse with you on uh, outside of social media. That's where you can find me. And remember, <laughs> at the end of every day, average is easy. Don't be it.